So please welcome uh, Joanna Schwartz. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me and um, inviting me to talk about my book, um, Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable. Um, I, uh, maybe I'll describe a little bit about how this book came to, to be, um, and, and then I'll tell you a bit about um, what I argue in the book. Um, so I'm a law professor at UCLA Law School, and I've been there since 2006. Um, but before I joined UCLA, I was a civil rights lawyer in New York City. And I worked on a lot of civil rights litigation, constitutional litigation against the New York Police Department, the New York City Department of Corrections, um, as well as other uh, government agencies in New York and police departments outside of New York. And I went into civil rights litigation because I uh, was, was really passionate about the criminal justice system. Um, I considered uh, becoming a public defender. And uh, I decided that I wanted to do plaintiff side civil rights work because it struck me that it was um, a powerful and important way to get justice for people whose rights have been violated by the government and also to try to advance some uh, reforms that would make, you know, deter future misconduct. And as a law student, that's sort of what I had been taught that civil rights litigation was aimed at doing. And when I uh, became a civil rights lawyer, I quickly began to question uh, the, the, the way in which um, civil rights litigation worked and the extent to which these promises of compensation and deterrence actually uh, were, were being operationalized on the ground. Um, and it's just one example. Um, I worked on a class action against the New York City Department of Corrections for excessive force um, and other constitutional violations on what's known as Rikers Island, um, where New York City, uh, many, most New York City prisoners are housed. And that was a case that involved lots and lots of um, excessive force uh, incidents. And then it was also alleging, you know, a, a systemic uh, failure to supervise and train and the like. And when I was deposing corrections officers who had used uh, excessive force against our clients in preparing for those depositions, I would look through the officer's personnel files. And I was surprised again and again to find that there was no record or information about prior lawsuits in their personnel files. Um, then when I deposed these officers and asked them whether they had been sued in the past, they uh, either didn't remember at all whether they had been named in a lawsuit or said that uh, they remembered that they had been sued, but they didn't know how many times they'd been sued. They didn't know what the allegations were in those cases. They didn't know uh, whether they had won or lost. And if they had lost, they didn't know how much had been paid. Um, and as someone who was bringing these cases and working on these cases with the goal of uh, preventing future misconduct in part, uh, it was a pretty shocking thing for me to discover that the officers who I was deposing didn't know anything about the cases that were brought against them. And when we deposed supervisors, even up to the assistant wardens uh, and the warden uh, himself, they didn't know anything about the litigation history of their officers either. So that really stuck with me and, and other things that I observed during my time as a civil rights lawyer stuck with me. Uh, and when I came to UCLA and became a law professor, I really decided that I wanted to examine um, that question uh, uh, first to, to, to wonder whether um, those officers were just lying to me or whether they truly didn't know anything about these cases and whether this was unique to New York or whether this was something that was uh, going on around the country. Um, and that was really the first question that I researched as a law professor um, about the realities of civil rights litigation. And I kept, uh, you know, right, doing a studies that kept raising other questions for me, other empirical questions about how civil rights 
litigation works on the ground. And um, and fast forward 15 years, um, I had amassed uh, a, a great deal of research about civil rights litigation, the realities of these cases, how they function. And um, then in May of, of 2020, George Floyd, of course, was murdered. And there became a lot of conversation questioning about how people can get justice in these cases when their constitutional rights have been violated. Um, and I decided to write this book to um, take some of the insights that I had learned over the course of my decade and a half doing this research and the other years that I had um, as a litigator in these cases and try to explain how uh, civil rights litigation functions to people who don't choose to read law review articles on the weekends, but instead, uh, you know, want to um, get an understanding in um, a, a relatively straightforward way about how civil rights litigation works. And, and that's the goal of my book. And what I argue, what I show in Shielded is that when people have had their rights violated, bringing a lawsuit is often the only available and sometimes the best available means toward getting some sort of accountability and justice. Uh, there are other avenues. Uh, an officer, for example, can be criminally prosecuted um, for a constitutional violation, but that very rarely happens. Uh, the best evidence is that about 2% of officers who kill people are criminally prosecuted, um, and only about a third of those officers are convicted. Um, and when you're thinking about non-fatal force or other kinds of constitutional violations, criminal prosecutions are vanishingly rare. Uh, another possible uh, avenue for some sort of consequences for officers is through internal police department investigations, discipline, and termination. And um, for a whole variety of reasons, uh, namely for protections that police unions have put into effect um, that uh, limit those kinds of investigations um, and allow for a lot of process to review those investigations um, if there has been a finding of wrongdoing. Uh, for all of those reasons, internal police department discipline uh, rarely happens, um, is rarely effective. And so for many people whose rights have been violated, what they are left with as an option uh, is to file a lawsuit seeking money damages or other kinds of forward-looking relief. Um, and in many ways, filing a lawsuit is a better tool than a criminal prosecution or, or internal affairs uh, investigation and discipline to achieve some form of justice. For one thing, a person can file a lawsuit on their own. They don't have to wait for an investigator or a criminal prosecutor to decide to act. Uh, once a person files a lawsuit, they can uncover a great deal of information about what happened in the case. Um, that is information that a prosecutor or internal affairs investigator would be under no obligation to make public. And if the person is successful, they can recover money or some sort of forward looking reform. And those are kinds of remedies that are not available any other way. So for all of these reasons, uh, filing a lawsuit is often the best or only means of getting some sort of justice in these cases. But um, as I explain in the book, uh, the, the path to getting justice through a civil rights lawsuit is extraordinarily difficult. And that is because uh, the United States Supreme Court and state and local governments across the country have created so many barriers to relief in these cases that the police are uh, all but untouchable in these kinds of suits. Now, you may hear this and think, well, you may think of, of cases that you know of that have settled or have resulted in a plaintiff's verdict. You may think of um, 
George Floyd's family's case, which settled for 27 or $28 million um, relatively quickly after his murder. Um, but a key thing to understand is that the shields that protect law enforcement and other government officials in these cases operate, have the most power in cases that you've never heard of regarding people who you've never heard of. When there is a lot of public attention on a case, uh, these shields seem to lose their power. Um, and that is why in this book, I really focus on the stories of people who you haven't ever heard of before. I thought I would read to you just briefly about one of those stories. Um, that is the first story that I tell, part of the introduction. Uh, to give you a sense of what I mean. On the afternoon of February 8th, 2018, more than two dozen law enforcement officers crowded into a conference room in the Henry County Sheriff's Office on the outskirts of Atlanta. They were preparing to execute a no-knock warrant at 305 English Road, the home of a drug dealer who'd been under investigation for almost two years and had gathered for a briefing about the operation. The special agent leading the briefing told the team that 305 English Road was a small house with off-white siding and several broken down cars out front, showed them an aerial photograph of the house and gave them turn-by-turn -turn directions to get there. All of the members of the task force had the opportunity to review a copy of the warrant, which described the target house and its surroundings, but only one, Captain David Cody, who was leading the operation, took the time to read it. And even Captain Cody didn't read it all the way through. The officers piled into their SUVs to head to 305 English Road, but ignored the directions they received during the briefing. Instead, an officer plugged the address into the GPS on his cell phone and the convoy got lost. When the officers finally arrived at their destination, the house described in the warrant was right in front of them, run down, off white, with cars strewn across the yard. But the entry team walked swiftly past 305 English Road and toward 303 English Road, 40 yards away. The house at 303 English Road looked nothing like the house described in the briefing and in the warrant. It was tidy and yellow with a carefully maintained grass yard. The mailbox at the end of the driveway made abundantly clear it was not the house the task force was looking for. Yet less than a minute after getting out of their cars, officers deployed flash grenades outside 303 English Road and used battering rams to smash open all three doors of the home. Inside, they found Henri Norris, a 78-year-old black man wearing a baseball cap, jeans, and a windbreaker. For more than 50 years, until February 8, 2018, Norris had lived peacefully at 303 English Road. He and his wife had raised their three children there. He'd spent decades traveling back and forth from that home to his job at a nearby rock quarry. Now Norris was retired and lived alone. Although he was still married to his wife, they got along better living separately and saw each other on Sundays at church. His children had grown up, moved away, and had children of their own. Norris was no drug dealer. He had never been in any trouble with the law. He'd never even received a traffic ticket. Henri Norris was watching the evening news in an armchair in his bedroom when he heard a thunderous sound as if a bomb had gone off in his house. He got up to see what the commotion was and saw a crowd of men in military gear in his hallway. Norris was more than twice as old as the target of the search warrant, but the officers pointed assault rifles at him anyway and yelled at him to raise his hands and get on the ground. When Norris told the officers that his knees were in bad shape, an officer grabbed Norris, pushed him down, and twisted his arm behind his back. Norris's chest began to hurt, and he had trouble breathing. He told the officers that he had heart trouble. He'd had bypass surgery and used a pacemaker. But they kept him on the ground for several minutes and never sought medical care. Norris was eventually picked up and led outside in handcuffs. When the officers realized they had blasted their way into the wrong house, they turned their cameras off one by one. So Henri Norris 
and his children and his grandchildren after this horrific event wanted some form of justice. Henri Norris filed a civilian complaint against Captain Cody and the other officers. Nothing ever came of it. There was never any possibility that these officers were going to be criminally prosecuted. So Henri Norris found a lawyer and he, with that lawyer, filed a lawsuit trying to seek some form of justice through compensation for his the violation of his rights. And uh, it was a legal defense called qualified immunity that many people have heard of over the past couple of years. Uh, it was qualified immunity that shut the courthouse door on Henri Norris. Uh, qualified immunity is a defense that the Supreme Court created in 1967. And it's a defense that the Supreme Court says today means that even if a person has had their constitutional rights violated by law enforcement or another government official, that government official is protected, shielded from any damages liability in that case, so long as they didn't violate clearly established law. And what the Supreme Court has said is that the law is only clearly established when there's a prior court opinion holding unconstitutional nearly identical facts. To give you a sense of just how qualified immunity operates and how qualified immunity operated in Henri Norris's case, I want to tell you a little bit, read again from the book briefly about the decision granting qualified immunity to the officers in Henri Norris's case. So the judges who heard Norris's case agreed that the officers searched his home without a warrant and that searching a house without a warrant is presumptively unreasonable. The judges also recognized that officers who execute a search warrant on the wrong home violate the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution unless they have made, quote, a reasonable effort to ascertain and identify the place intended to be searched. In fact, the very same court that had decided Norris's case in 2021 had ruled five years earlier that it was unconstitutional for an officer who executed a warrant on the wrong house to detain its residents at gunpoint, almost exactly what had happened to Henri Norris. But that prior court decision was not enough to defeat qualified immunity in Norris's case because it was unpublished, meaning it was available online but not in the books of decisions that are issued each year, and so was not technically binding on the court. The court declined to publish its decision in Norris's case as well. So if in the future, officers hold the wrong person at gunpoint after executing a search warrant at the wrong house, the law still won't be clearly established and those officers can receive qualified immunity too. It's cases like Henri Norris's, I think, that have caused there to be so much attention placed on qualified immunity doctrine and so much criticism of that doctrine. I think that the criticism of qualified immunity is, uh, is well justified. However, part of what I argue in Shielded is that Qualified immunity is only the tip of the iceberg. There are multiple barriers to relief at every stage of the litigation process that make it difficult to find a lawyer, plead a complaint, meaning include enough factual allegation in the complaint to merit uh, in the court's view, the Supreme Court's view that the case can move forward to discovery. There are challenges uh, proving a constitutional violation, and only when you get past all of those barriers uh, do you get to qualified immunity. To just give you one uh, other brief uh, illustration of how those various barriers can work together, I want to tell you briefly about the story of a man named Tony Timpa. Um, and really, it's a story about his mother, Vicki Timpa, who uh, got a call uh, she lives in Dallas, got a call um, on an August evening in 2016 with the unfathomable news that her son, Tony, was dead. And Tony was a white, wealthy, 
executive who made a quarter of a million dollars a year, hadn't been in any real trouble with the law, and she couldn't possibly imagine uh, how how she could be receiving this phone call. Um, she uh, called the department, tried to get information. They wouldn't give her any information about what, what had happened to her son. And this was even though they had body camera video in their own possession that showed exactly what had happened to her son. She uh, found a lawyer um, who usually would not take a case like this, um, but because they had learned that there was body camera video and he hoped that he could get that body camera video, he agreed to take her case. And because they didn't have the video and they didn't have other records, they filed a complaint that said that the that Tony had died in the custody of the Dallas Police Department, but uh, they didn't know the names of the officers and they didn't know precisely how Tony had died. They didn't know those things because the Dallas Police Department wouldn't turn that information over to her. And yet when she filed this bare bones complaint, the, uh, the Dallas Police Department moved to dismiss it saying that she had not pled what Supreme Court calls a plausible entitlement to relief in this case because she hadn't included enough facts to plausibly show that she would recover in the case, even though uh, all she needed was information that the Dallas Police Department already had in their possession in order to, uh, to, to make that finding. Um, as I describe in the book, uh, she ultimately was able to get that information, but it was only after her lawyer filed a separate lawsuit uh, with, it, with an entirely separate claim for the, the documents themselves and the body camera video to be turned over. Um, and many lawyers would not have invested the time and effort um, to go through that second litigation, um, especially when lawyers in these cases are not paid anything unless they win and then are usually only paid fraction um, of that recovery, which often results in only a fraction of the amount of time that they've um, spent on the case. Um, after pleading a complaint, after getting past that standard, a person has to show that their constitutional rights were violated. And the key thing phrase in many of these cases is uh, unreasonable searches and seizures. And it might sound like, uh, certainly sounds to me like a seizure or a search is unreasonable so long as the person has done nothing wrong. If they haven't done anything wrong and they are arrested or stopped or searched or force is used against them, then that should be unreasonable. But the way the Supreme Court has interpreted that part of the Fourth Amendment is not from the perspective of the person who possesses that right, but from the perspective of the police officer who's infringing it. And what the Supreme Court has said is that a use of force isn't excessive so long as it is objectively reasonable under the totality of the circumstances that the officer's facing at the time. And what that means in practical terms is that a person who is absolutely innocent of, of any wrongdoing can be arrested, can be searched, can be uh, have used force used against them, can even be killed, and still not have had their constitutional rights violated if the officer believed at the time that what they had done was reasonable. And it's only after you get past all of those other challenges and barriers to relief do you get to qualified immunity. Um, even when a person gets past all of those all of those uh, challenging standards, they then have to convince a jury uh, that they should be compensated and compensated for the totality of their, of their losses. Uh, but as I show in the book, many cases um, end up resulting in a defense verdict, the cases that make it to trial. And this, I think, as I describe in the book, is in part because of the ways in which juries are selected. Um, 
which I argue uh, ends up weeding out many people who would be sympathetic to plaintiffs in these cases. But even if you if you get past all of those things and you ultimately do get some sort of settlement or judgment in a case, I have found that the ways in which the goals of deterrence in these cases are often undermined. Individual officers very, very rarely pay anything uh, toward the settlements and judgments in these cases. Police departments very rarely suffer any financial consequences of these cases. And as proof of the, of the initial um, impetus for some of this research that I mentioned at the beginning, um, police departments across the country often fail to gather and analyze information from these cases in a way that they could use that information uh, to reduce the likelihood of future misconduct. Now, all of these barriers to relief um, have in one way or another been justified by a pretty frightening story about uh, what would happen if justice were too easy to obtain in these cases. And it's a story that's been told ever since uh, the Supreme Court first recognized the ability to bring these kinds of cases in 1961. And the, and the horror story goes something like this. If lawsuits were too easy to bring, then courthouses would overflow with frivolous lawsuits. Officers would be bankrupted for good faith mistakes that they make on the job. No one uh, faced with those threats would ever agree to become a police officer and chaos would reign uh, because there would be no dedicated police force. Um, and it's truly the Supreme Court's decisions and dec statements by local legislators really echo those concerns. And we can see it often now today in uh, debates about qualified immunity, um, where these kinds of horror stories are often invoked by defenders of qualified immunity to argue why we need the doctrine. These are the kinds of claims that I've really spent the last 15 years as an academic researching. And what I have found and what I explain in the book is that these claims are um, one after another overblown, if not downright false. Um, and I'll just mention a couple of, of those findings um, for you. So as I just said, um, defenses of qualified immunity often focus on the claim that officers will be bankrupted um, for good faith mistakes that they make on the job. So um, there's really two components about that claim, one about officers being bankrupted and one of, about them being found liable for good faith mistakes. And both are uh, unsupported by the law and reality on the ground. When I looked at 81 law enforcement agencies across the country and the payments in police misconduct suits over a six year period, I found that 99.98% of the dollars paid to plaintiffs in those cases came from local governments or insurers, not the police officers themselves. I found two jurisdictions out of the 81 where officers were ever made to contribute and they were made to contribute on average $4,000 which is not the makings of a bankruptcy petition. And the reason that officers are shielded from financial liability in these cases has nothing to do with qualified immunity. Instead, it is state and local governments indemnification agreements, agreements by statute or policy that provide that when an officer is sued, that a lawyer will be provided to them and that any settlement or judgment will be paid from public funds. In California, the statute requires that local governments pay settlements and judgments for cases that um, that are, arise out of the course and scope of the officer's uh, work on the job and require indemnification in those circumstances. The statute also allows local governments to indemnify officers um, even when they are in to indemnify officers for punitive damages awards, which are awards entered by juries as an in, intentionally to punish the officer. The local governments can be uh, can pick up the, the tab in those cases as well. And they have that that financial protection has nothing to do with qualified immunity. As far as the concern that officers will be found liable for good faith mistakes made in a split second on the job, the Fourth Amendment, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, 
already protects officers um, for that kind of good faith split second mistake. They do not need qualified immunity for that either. And as I mentioned in the beginning, part of my goal in um, telling, in writing this book was to describe this kind of research and to explain um, the ways in which justifications for these many barriers to relief are really unsupported by the evidence on the ground. Another reason uh, I'm really glad to have written this book I was to be able to tell the stories of people like Henri Norris and Vicki Timpa. Um, I actually just was in uh, Dallas um, earlier this week and uh, saw, got to meet Vicki Timpa. I'd spoken to her um, many times before and it was, this happened to her son in 2016 and, and it is like it happened yesterday for her. She, it is still so completely raw um, and, uh, you know, this book came out on Valentine's Day, which is sort of a weird timing for a book about police misconduct. Uh, I didn't choose the date, but she said um, that it was sort of perfect in her mind that it was on Valentine's Day because she thinks of it as a memory and a tribute to her son. And, you know, to the extent that that this book can offer um, any um any way in which the the stories of these people um, whose lives have been shattered by the police and then shattered again by the court system, um, to the extent that this book can share those stories and can um, offer some measure of justice to these people, um, it is it is a real uh, it, it it is it is really a a, a goal for me um, uh, for this book for for whatever that is uh, to the extent that that is possible. Now, someone before the uh, the talk began said that, that she had been reading this book. She was on chapter 10 and, and it seemed like a, a pretty big bummer. And, and I will admit this is uh, a bit of a downer of a book. I mean, if you if you can find a chipper and cheerful book about police misconduct, I'd be really interested in uh, taking a look at it. But um, it is a somber book. But but part of what I do in the last chapter of the book is offer what I call a better way. And to be clear, I don't, I don't pretend to say that in the final chapter of the book, I offer a solution, you know, a flip to switch that all of a sudden will enter us into an age, a golden age of accountability um, or an age in which uh, policing uh, you know, is is no longer a, a scourge um, in our society. But I do offer some practical suggestions um, that don't rely on the Supreme Court and don't rely on Congress because I've 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 lost a lot of faith in in both institutions to fix um, these problems. But but actually, um, I think that there is a tremendous amount that can be done at the state and even more so at the local level. Uh, to improve policing um, and reduce the kinds of harms that I talk about in the book. And, and some of those changes are at what you might call the, the front end, front end accountability measures, limiting the kinds of interactions that people have with the police, limiting traffic stops, limiting the you know, police authority to, um, to engage in low level traffic stops, which is something that's being experimented with around the country, uh, limiting police involvement in uh, responses to people who are in mental health crisis, um, also something that is being explored around the country. And there's also a lot of important things that can be done at the, you know, what you think of as back end accountability, when there has been um, some form of misconduct, some sort of uh, harm that has occurred, making that system work better. Um, states uh, across the country have considered, introduced and considered bills to create state law causes of action uh, for constitutional violations without qualified immunity as a defense. California considered um, something like this in 2020 and um, unfortunately the bill failed. Um, but in Colorado and New Mexico and New York City, um, so this kind of legislation was passed. Um, and it, as I said, it's being considered and I think it's gonna continue to be considered by various state legislatures. Um, there's also, I think, important work that can be done 
at the city level. Um, city governments um, are responsible for setting police departments budgets and the budgets throughout the city. And there's two recommendations, concrete recommendations that I think can be accomplished uh, through pressure to city councils. One is that settlements and judgments in police misconduct cases should come from the police department's budget. And settlements and judgments for other city agencies uh, should come out of their budgets. Um, you know, settlements and judgments in police misconduct cases amount to less than 1% of most uh, most local governments' budgets, whereas the police department uh, ends up um, costing a quarter to a third or even more of uh, local government budgets. And what I have found is that in jurisdictions where settlements and judgments do come from the police department's budget, uh, there is some more attention paid to those settlements and judgments. Again, I don't mean to suggest that that, that alone will create a working system, but it seems like a, a very basic baseline. Um, and another basic baseline, I think, is to have local governments, city councils, who are providing this money to these agencies to require them to gather and analyze information from lawsuits that are brought against them with an eye toward improving uh, whatever it was that happened in this that case and preventing it from happening in the future. This is a kind of risk management move that people that private industries uh, all over the place uh, regularly engage in. And yet there is this sort of silo in many cities uh, where the money to the defense of a case and the money to settle that case is paid and comes from one arm of government, city council's office or the, or the city comptroller's office. And the information about those cases don't end up in the police department um, and in the police department's sort of understanding of, of how to mitigate risk at all. So those are two, uh, you know, two sort of basic things that could happen at the city council level, as well as policies that could address the the front end. Um, and I don't, um, again, think that those are that's an exhaustive list. I think that there's a lot of actually very interesting things happening at the state and local level in California um, that will can incrementally improve um, what we, you know, the way our system works. Um, and we should continue to pursue those and other efforts. Um, and I think that it's really important to, I'm, I'm glad to be here in this conversation. I'm glad that you uh, are also engaged um, in these efforts. And I think it's really important to continue to be engaged in these efforts uh, steadily and, and not simply in moments where a uh, horrifying viral video captures um, public attention um, about these issues. Um, and that's actually sort of how I ended my introduction and maybe how I'll, I'll end this conversation and then we can open it up for questions. Um, what I say in the last, the last paragraph of the introduction is, uh, we cannot wait for another viral video to restart our national conversation about police violence and reform. And we must foreground the realities of civil rights litigation when we do. Myths about the dangers of making it too easy to sue police have made a mess of our system. A shared understanding of how officers are shielded from the consequences of their actions and how those shields leave many victims without a meaningful remedy must fuel a reimagining of what it means to hold government accountable and what it means to protect and serve. So I think we're right at the... Uh, 45 minute mark and I will stop there and uh, look forward to any questions that you may have. Wow, thanks so much. So since we're a small group, I think it would be fine for people to uh, raise their Zoom hands and then I'll call on them to unmute and ask their questions. So let me, uh, I, I got one in the chat from, uh, from Leah Pressman. Um, I was, um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about having police collect and analyze their own data. Um, you know, just sort of thinking about The Wire and David Simon and, and having my own experience of having them misunderstand every aspect of data and or just misrepresent it altogether. Uh, shouldn't there be an independent um, agency? with some expertise. 
Yes, I think that that's I think that that's absolutely right. And and sort of in speaking quickly, I I didn't um, I didn't uh, parse that out um, exactly. I think that I think that having an independent um, inspector general or 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 auditor um, is is the way to go in those cases. And I talk in um, chapter twelve of the book about the experience that New York City has had with these kinds of efforts. Um, the New York City Comptroller's Office, which is where the money comes from to satisfy settlements and judgments, there's, you know, they're the the the, the pocketbook. Um, they've been asking the NYPD to gather and analyze information from these lawsuits for decades. And the NYPD has said, no, thank you. Um, and what ended up happening was that, that the uh, city council created an officer of inspector general who, um, and then author, then the office of inspector general said, uh, NYPD, you should do a better job of collecting, gathering and analyzing this information. And they said, mm, you know, maybe, but we're still not interested. <laughs> and then the city council gave the office of the inspector general the authority to um, look at that information themselves. And, it's been a, a you know the the over the years um, through a fair bit of cajoling, the Office of Inspector General has uh, gotten the NYPD to do a better job of gathering and analyzing this information, um, and uh, at least you know sort of toward the toward the 2018 2019. Um, lawsuits were were going down and and both the office of inspector general and the NYPD believed that things had improved because of um, these efforts in part to gather and analyze this information um the NYPD is doing a or has been has done a fair bit of that work themselves but it was really through the pressure of this oversight um entity so yes i i agree absolutely with your skepticism about the idea that um, the police department, a police department would do this on their own without, you know, without any, um, other, you know, assistance or requirements. Um, but I think that what's happened in New York is it is an interesting model. And, and there are other places like Portland that have used an outside, um, independent auditor, um, who, that, who's also done that kind of work. Thanks. Um, Danny Young, you had your hand up. Do you still want to ask a question or did she cover it? Uh, well, I just wasn't sure if it was a good question or not, but um, I'll, I'll throw it no out there. No bad questions. No bad uh, questions. All right. Appreciate it. Um, I mean, it's all very dismal and hard to, to confront, really. And I'm just asking myself, like, is there any, like, um, comparison overseas like do, 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 is this a uniquely american problem or do, like the cops in the uk get away with the same kind of stuff like i feel like our system is set up in a way like at least philosophically to be able to prevent this sort of thing but it seems like it, it doesn't at all so i'm wondering like you, you know is this built into our whole judicial system or is this like is there any comparison overseas basically is the question yeah you know i haven't done that comparative work myself my my understanding is that you know there are different problems <laughs> everywhere and and um and in some ways you know our judicial system is painted at least as you know much more plaintiff friendly than than other systems mm -hmm. um so uh it, but but you know, in different places, the you know police forces are are organized in different ways, regulated in different ways. I mean, our our system is also um, there's very little regulation outside the litigation um, system as well, which which may make us unique. But the 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 short answer is that that I don't really know. Um, I will say one other thing, which is, I do think that the system is very bleak. I think that it's absolutely stacked. Mm -hmm. um, against plaintiffs in these cases, including people who have had their rights grievously wronged. I also think that um, that there are, you know, there are victories that that happen. There are changes that happen. Um, there are improvements, um, including improvements that are negotiated as part of um, settlements or resolutions in these cases. And so, um, 
you know, I think that um, it is a the, the the system is absolutely stacked against plaintiffs in these cases. Um, but I also think that um, it it and that is dismal. But there are also um, examples, repeated examples um, of of people who are are able to get through all these barriers. Um, it's just much more difficult than it should be. Thanks. Uh, somebody texted me a question, which I'm going to ask for them, which is, um, what can you say about the interface of police and public schools, school resource officers, cops on campus in general, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I mean, I guess, I, I, I mean, I, I think that what I would say is that everything that I've described, um, all of these, these challenges um, to accountability, uh, you know, exist equally um, with with um, public school resource officers, so long as they're you know uh, government um, or you know uh, public employees. Um, and you know, I I certainly it's not the it's not the area that I myself research, but I've certainly read um, a, a lot about the proliferation of school resource officers and police officers in schools. And, you know, in the same way as I as I was saying that uh, we need to think about front end measures like reducing traffic stops and reducing police officers' responses to people in mental health crisis. I mean, I would, I would add to that list. I think that uh, I would join with those who say that we really should be rethinking um, whether we need police in our schools and and what they what they should be doing there, um, and that they are um, taking on a role um, that uh, you know that 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 doesn't make a whole lot of sense for them. Yeah, I don't know if you recommend the chapter in Alex Vitale's book about uh, cops on campus, but I, I certainly would. Oh, sure, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, Cynthia? Um, I was just thinking about what, what part of what the books put me in mind of is, is what on earth makes these police officers think that, that um, acting on pure cussed racism is, is okay and a good idea. There's something about the culture or maybe something about the officers that are recruited. Um, I, I'm hearing that Mayor Bass wants to wants to hire hundreds of of new officers, and her own police department's telling her eh, it's going to be really hard to find that many. Are they going to just recruit the dregs? I mean, will Angelinos really be safer if there are hundreds of new racist thugs? I mean, do they become racist because of the culture, or 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 did they start out that way? I. Well, so I mean, I think that there's a lot there in that in that question. I think, you know, I'm I'm of the view that there are there are um, there are certainly well intentioned uh, officers out there, um, and part of the focus of my book um, is part of the goal of my book is is to not take a position on how many well intentioned officers there are, how many good officers and bad officers, but to say that. We can hopefully, no matter what position you take on that point, we can agree that there are instances where officers cross the line and act um, truly inappropriately, unconscionably, unconstitutionally, and what are and what should be the consequences in those cases. Um, and so all of the stories that you read in Shielded are stories of uh, you know, really, really bad conduct. Um, and it's it's uh, you know it's often sort of bad bad apples as they say but it's not just the the apple it's the entire tree and uh, you know I I don't think that you can understand uh, police misconduct and violence uh, and abuse without the broader systemic perspective and and I certainly do think that um, the culture of a police department can influence greatly how um, officers within that department act. And I have a whole chapter in the book focused on local government responsibility in these cases that focuses on, a, on the 
police department in Vallejo, California, that is that is truly rotten to the core. Um, and I don't know how you could become a police officer in Vallejo and not get sucked in, uh, you know, to this truly pervasive um, feel of misconduct and feel that there, there are no consequences for that misconduct. Um, I personally, you know, I, I think I agree. I'm guessing I agree, um, given the way that you phrased the question. I don't think that more cops means more safety, uh, certainly not, not necessarily. Um, and in part, uh, that is because, uh, you know, you, you, you want, one wants to have very high standards for people who you give badges and guns to. Um, and also because, um, as I suggested earlier in my comments, I don't think that we need police officers to do a lot of the work that police officers currently do. So in my ideal world, instead of simply hiring many, many more police officers, we would think about what the work is that police officers do, how much time they spend responding to people in mental health crisis, responding, you know, going and, and stopping people for nonviolent, uh, you know, non-risky traffic violations, um, you know, and the like, and and hire people uh, in proportion to different local agencies and nonprofits that are best suited to work in all of those different areas. And I think that if we did, we would not need to hire, uh, we would not be, have trouble uh, hiring uh, enough officers. Thanks. So I think we'll take Rebecca, Donna, and Alex, and then call it a night if that's okay. Um, so, uh, Rebecca, please go ahead. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, too bad it's necessary. Um, my understanding is that there, well, there's at least one law, and pro I believe more than one law in California, that makes um, it very difficult for regular people like us to get data. And um, I don't know if it's like that in other states or if we're some sort of an exception. Um, I would like to see legislators here try to do something about that. But at any rate, uh, do you have any comments about that? Well, I do think that, uh, you know, there are, that is a focus of, of efforts um, around the country to, to create more transparency. Um, and there have been some some advancements um, in that regard in California, um, but uh, but 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 limited. I mean, as my comments about Dallas and the Dallas Police Department reflect, you know, in in Dallas, um, you know, they're they're in Texas. There are there are great limits on what kind of information can be turned over, um, and and I do think that this is a really important. Um, aspect as well and and should be a focus for state legislation. Greg Donna. Uh, Donna, are you there? Okay, Alex, go ahead. Thank you. Um, <laughs> are you still are locked. Um, so I'm kind of fascinated by the by how hard it is to get work like yours into the public consciousness and, and to change public opinions. And in my experience, there's nothing harder than policing um, in in doing that. Which is all a long wind up to say, um, have you have you found any particular way to get into people's minds and change opinions on policing? And second part, maybe more hopeful, I think. Um, have you noticed a difference in, uh, you say, law students and how receptive they are to critical, critically thinking about policing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, to take the second point first, um, you know, I started teaching at UCLA in 2006. And uh, I think, you know, I, I've been thinking about policing, you know, since the early 2000s um, with my own work. Um, and I would say that, you know, there was always an interest, but I think that, I think that uh, since, um, frankly, since Trump was elected um, and there was a sense that it was lawyers who were going to the airports and, you know, stopping the, the um, travel restrictions, 
um, and doing various other kinds of things um, in 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 the courts. I think there's been more interest in doing civil rights work and seeing um, litigation as an important tool. And partic- and then post 2000, I mean 2020, excuse me, uh, with the murder of George Floyd, the 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 entire conversation has has shifted. I mean I've been teaching courses in civil rights litigation and and P- police misconduct litigation for years. Um, and beginning in 2020, um, students started talking about abolition, which is something that they had never talked about um, before. And I think that, uh, so I do think that there is a shift in public, in, in law student consciousness for certain. Um, as far as how to get these ideas out there, I mean, writing a book <laughs> was partially the goal of, you know, to get these ideas out there and to get them in a format and with to to an audience that um, would not have otherwise read the book. And I do think that there is some, some um, ways in which that, that has, you know, that hopefully that is, that is helping. I know that, um, you know, there was legislation pending in, in Washington state and apparently a legislator read the book and, and uh, it influenced his decision. Um, who knows, uh, the bill ultimately died in committee, but but maybe it changed one person's mind. Um, I do think that there is some shift, um, some hopeful shift um, that that is happening. Um, and, you know, to leave you on a, on a hopeful note, I, I was in, um, San Antonio, Texas, uh, on Monday at the judicial conference for the fifth circuit court of appeals, which is the federal judges in Texas, um, and in Mississippi and in Louisiana. And, uh, you know, not what you would expect to be a pretty, not what you expect to be a sympathetic crowd for, um, conversations critical about qualified immunity. I was on a panel about qualified immunity and um, there's two of us who are critical of the doctrine and two of us, two of them who, uh, you know, one worked for the AG's office in Louisiana and one was uh, counsel for the federal, uh, the, the um, fraternal order of police. And though the, 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 the AG's uh, representative and the, and the lawyer for the fraternal order of the police agreed that, uh, you know, these cases granting qualified immunity where the conduct seems um, egregious, but there simply isn't a prior court case on point. They agreed that that was unjust and shouldn't be the way that things work. And they they were compelled by the stories, by this, by the particular cases that we were talking about. You know, cases like a case called Jessup versus City of Fresno in Fresno, California, where officers stole a quarter of a million dollars in cash and rare coins executing a warrant, but got qualified immunity because even though the conduct was wrong, there wasn't a prior court case that said so. And these, you know, these these um, sort of government types were, uh, you know, thought that that was an outrageous decision, thought that it was wrongly decided. And I'm hopeful that that whether it's that, you know, the evidence is coming out about how these cases work on the ground or the stories are being told. And, you know, if you're a defender of qualified immunity in its current form, you've got to defend, you know, cases like Jessup versus City of Fresno. And I think faced with those stories, um, there may be some shift. And, you know, judges were in the audience and I hope they were listening. Um, but uh, this is how I, you know, imagine uh, optimistically that change can can happen through evidence, through stories, um, and just continuing to pound the pavement with the message. Thanks. Let me go back to Donna, see if, uh, Donna, are you there now? Hey, Donna. Okay. Um, So, uh, gosh, thank you so much for being so generous with your time to, to spend oh, with us tonight. It's it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Can I ask what you're working on next or do you need a little rest? <laughs> uh, I'm, you know, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that through for, for right now, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really just continuing to, uh, to spread the word about this book, but, um, 
uh, I'll, I'm, 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 I'm contemplating my summer's, my summer's work is figuring out what's next. Well, we'll be waiting for it. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you.